EZ Sports. It's in the shame. EZ Sports. It's in the shame. Cartoon creators are the worst 2020. On November 2nd, 2018, I published a video titled The Blacklisted Animation Industry Insider, where I debunked a video made by the YouTuber Easy Peasy. In that video, he claimed that an anonymous source that used to work in the animation industry gave him some juicy information about the behind the scenes inner workings of the industry, which primarily consisted of allegations against several high profile cartoon showrunners. If you watched the original video, then you probably know that most of the allegations were either laughably implausible or outright false, and what made it even worse was the complete lack of evidence to back up these allegations, the overwhelming amount of bias easy showcased throughout the entire video, and the oddly personal attacks against the alleged cartoon creators in question. With all that being said, you're probably wondering why I'm revisiting this video two years after the fact. To put it simply, I have some unfinished business to take care of. There were some points in the original video that I either completely glossed over or forgot to mention, there are some points that upon further reflection I wanted to expand on, and there are some new points I wanted to debunk to make this expansion a well-rounded affair, so if you liked the original video, you'll probably like this 1.5 version. So without further ado, let's jump back into Cartoon World. This is the blacklisted animation Industry Insider 1.5. Luke met Dana Terrace while he was working as a summer intern at the digital media company Jib Jab, where he developed a crush on her. Unfortunately, he never got a chance to tell her how he felt because she started dating Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch. To say he was unhappy about this would be an understatement, so if you're wondering why all of the allegations against Hirsch were laughably implausible, that's why. Luke was so upset that Alex had stolen his dream girl that he allegedly threatened Dana with a knife, which forced her to file a police report against him. He also allegedly threatened several of his co-workers with rape and assault. He was fired from Steven Universe for allegedly showing Rebecca Sugar a picture of himself fucking Pearl. He's also allegedly schizophrenic and difficult to work with, which is why people warned other studios to not work with him, which is not hard to believe because the animation industry is small and close-knit, which means people tend to talk to one another. So, for all intents and purposes, he's been blacklisted, but not because of ideological differences, it's because he's allegedly a raging asshole. At the tail end of the original video, I talked about the allegations that allegedly led to Luke's blacklisting from the animation industry. Luke has not only claimed that these allegations are false, he has also claimed that his former co-workers frequented 4chan's comics and cartoons board and purposely spread these allegations in an attempt to destroy his career and get him blacklisted. There's just one big problem with that. Everyone on 4chan is anonymous, so even if what he was saying was true, we would have no way of knowing if an industry professional was the one to post those allegations against Luke because there are no usernames to trace and identify these individuals. And on top of all that, how in the hell would Luke know that his former co-workers were spreading alleged false allegations about him? Unless he has some kind of super secret identification software that can identify individuals on 4chan, there is no reason to believe that Luke would know that the individuals who posted these allegations about him are industry professionals. Most of them don't even know what 4chan is. And while I don't doubt that there are people in the industry that are petty enough to destroy someone's career with false allegations, I doubt it would be done on 4chan due to its limited reach. After all, I thought Twitter was the cancel cap capital of the world. We now move on from accusations of petty maliciousness to accusations of plagiarism. In late December of last year, Luke accused Dana Terrace, the creator of The Owl House, of ripping off the character design of Go from the recent season of the long-running Pokemon anime. 
Yeah, this is about as stupid as it sounds, so let's break it down, shall we? The Owl House was officially announced on February 23rd, 2018. The new season of the Pokemon anime, aka the 23rd season, was announced on September 30th, 2019, which was a full year later. The Owl House was initially conceived all the way back in 2015 and began development in 2017. It was initially supposed to premiere in 2019, but it was delayed to 2020 where it finally premiered on January 10th. The 23rd season of the Pokemon anime that featured Go premiered on November 17th, 2019 in Japan on TV Tokyo, while the first 12 episodes of the 23rd season premiered in the US on Netflix on June 12th, 2020. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's impossible for a show to steal a character design from another show that's made on an entirely separate continent. The Owl House is primarily produced in Glendale, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles, while the Pokemon anime is produced in Tokyo, Japan. Maybe if the Pokemon anime was produced in LA, you might have been able to make a case that somewhere in the deep web of relationships, Dana Terra somehow managed to obtain the early character design of Go and ripped it off to create the character design of Luz No Seda. But that's totally not the case, not just because of the time difference in terms of when they were both announced, but also because of the geographical difference, and the conception difference, and the overall plausibility difference. While Go's hair and face is similar to Lou's, I believe that this is purely a case of coincidence rather than Dana being a plagiarist. Luke made a mountain out of a molehill and tried to portray the situation as being far worse than what it actually was. This is a nothing burger that he tried to turn into a Big Mac, and to be honest with you, I don't believe for a second that he made this tweet because he actually wanted to call out plagiarism. He made this tweet as a way of throwing out a pot shot at Dana because I believe he's bitter that she's more successful than him. Gee, I wonder why. Plagiarism is a very serious accusation to make against somebody, and it shouldn't be used to try and damage someone's reputation purely because you don't like them. That kind of shit is so petty that it makes Richard jealous. Now that we've got Luke's tweets out of the way, let's move on to the main event itself. Okay, but moving on from one fuck up to the next. Since I've already brought her up, let's talk a little bit about Disney's first female showrunner, Darren Nafsey of Star VS. <laughs> If you actually bothered to do any sort of fact-checking, a mistake like this could have easily been avoided. Darren Nefsey was not Disney TVA's first female showrunner. That prestigious honor goes to a woman named Sue Rose, who created Pepper Ann all the way back in 1997 for Disney's One Saturday Morning block on ABC. The second woman to create a show for Disney TVA was Chris McNee, who created the preschool show Doc McStuffins for Disney Junior. Who was the third woman to create a show for Disney TVA? To answer that question, it's time for another game of The Young Hero's Obvious Questionnaire. Is it A. Darren Nepsey, B. Kayla White, C. Mabel Pines, or D. Luz No Seda? If you go on the show's Wikipedia page, they specifically state this fact. While it's true that Nepsey was the first woman to create a show that aired on Disney XD, Star vs. the Forces of Evil was produced by Disney Television Animation, and when you look at it from that lens, she was the third, not the first. I know this is a minor nitpick, but it was so egregious that I had to mention it. I want to give a huge shout out to Channel Even for pointing this mistake out to me in the comment section of the original video. Now, in my video, I gave Darren a compliment I am now forced to retract. I said that the art in the show is better than that of Steven Universe because Darren makes her new storyboard arts pass the test to be accepted onto the staff. And that's how it was painted to me in the article I read that was trying to make her look good. But that's not exactly true. See, 
Nefsi doesn't actually do this. I mean, at least not by choice. It's a requirement by Disney TVA for all of their shows. And not only does Nefsi not do that, she doesn't really do anything. If you thought what I said about Ward and Sugar made them sound lazy and useless, Nefsi is all of that, but 10 times worse. Nefsi is so incompetent that after the first season of the show aired, almost everyone who worked there either quit or planned to quit, and the show's directors intended to stage a coup and kick Nefsi out. She was only saved because one of them still liked her and refused to play along, and maybe much like Sugar, possibly because firing your first female showrunner after one season would have been bad optics. In spite of all of this, and in spite of the fact that Nafsi does literally nothing on the show besides sit in her office and doodle while the storyboarders fuck shit up like they did with Ward, Nafsi has the nerve to make her show even worse by randomly firing people she's angry at for no good reason. Elf Romanellis, for example, who was one of the show's only good artists, got temporarily kicked out for a while because something he said made Nafsi angry, and to this day apparently neither he nor anyone else really knows what exactly that even was. How is she allegedly incompetent? Why is she allegedly incompetent? A detailed explanation would have been helpful so we could have decided for ourselves whether or not the allegations you levied against her were true. We all know this video is bad for a multitude of reasons, which include a complete lack of consistency. He gives detailed explanations in the cases of Pendleton Ward and Rebecca Sugar in regards to their allegations, but for some reason he doesn't do that with Nepsi, which is one of the worst things you can do in a video that is meant to be a hard-hitting expose. Allegations like this have career-altering, and in some cases career-ending implications. You can't just decide to provide detailed explanations for the allegations against some individuals and not provide them for others, because that literally doesn't make any sense. You can't have your cake and eat it too, and what makes this even worse is the fact that he hypes up the allegations against Nepsi by proclaiming that she is worse than Ward and Sugar. But his only reason for believing this is her allegedly firing an artist for saying something that made her angry. If that was true, that would be incredibly petulant on her part. But it wouldn't be enough to say that she is worse than Ward and Sugar, especially when you didn't even bother to explain why she's so incompetent, and why she's ten times worse than Ward and Sugar, which is disappointing because I believe that the specifics of Nepsi's alleged incompetence was discussed at some point during the three hour long conversation he had with Luke, but for some reason he didn't bother to mention it in the video, which is perplexingly disappointing and incredibly anticlimactic. But I'm not surprised considering this is the same person that said that hiring women in animation was a mistake. And speaking of Star, it's also worth pointing out that most of the worst parts of the show were, just as I'd suspected, put there by Sabrina Katugo. And much like every other cartoonist currently working in this part of the industry, Sabrina's already been pegged to get her own show just by knowing the right people. The only thing stopping that from happening right now has been that Sabrina insists on making every single character, or at least every single protagonist, in her children's cartoon show a flaming homosexual. And while she could always take her show to Cartoon Network, who have much lower standards, they also pay you a lot less than Disney, and Sabrina's spoiled ass refuses to accept that. Sabrina possibly getting her own show is true, because she was one of 17 creators that signed an overall deal with Disney Television Animation last July. But the notion of that being held up because she wants every character in her children's cartoon to be a flaming homosexual is laughably implausible. The development of an animated series begins with the initial conception of an idea. Those initial ideas are then compiled into a pitch bible, which details the world the show is set in, the premise, character descriptions, initial character designs and artwork, and some initial episode ideas. If the network likes the pitch, they will order a pilot, which serves as a proof of concept to show the network what they can expect if they pick the show up as a series. Once the pilot is complete, the network will decide whether or not to give the pilot a series order. If the network decides that they do want to move forward, they will give the show a formal green light, which means the show can enter full production. Since it generally takes nine months to complete a single episode of an animated series, multiple episodes are worked on simultaneously, and the entire season is mass-produced at once. 
The pre-production is done within the studio itself, while the actual animation is done overseas because it's a lot cheaper to do the animation in Korea than it is in the United States. Once the entire season has completed production, the network will stockpile all of the episodes and decide when it will premiere and how they want to air it. The first season of Amphibia was burned off over the course of a month, with new episodes airing every weekday. While the second season is currently airing on a weekly basis alongside The Owl House and Big City Greens as part of Disney Channel's brand new Saturday Night Animation block. Obviously, there were some steps that I skipped in the process of making an animated series, and that's only because if I were to explain every little thing that goes into making a cartoon, we would literally be here all day. The point I'm trying to make here is that the factors I just mentioned are what is realistically holding up Sabrina's show from making it onto the air. It's not, she wants every character in her children's cartoon to be a flaming homosexual. This is a bigger travesty than the time Dory got her own talk show. 2003 should have been cancelled. The Walt Disney Company is trying to destroy the sanctity of marriage and are trying to turn our children into gay fishes. They are breaking the conditioning. <laughs> Alright, next let's talk about the person who got Nafsir a job. A person she used to go to school with. A person she used to fuck. If you thought what I said so far made the animation industry sound nepotistic, hold on to your asses because if the industry is incestuous, then Gravity Falls is a family reunion at an Alabama swamp and Alex Hirsch is the toothless patriarch everyone calls Uncle Dad. Alex Hirsch has fucked everyone. He fucked Nafsi when they were in college, he fucked some uh, cosplayer named Mansi D. Young, got bored, cheated on her with Dana Terrace, promoted Dana Terrace over and over despite her being one of the least experienced people working on Gravity Falls, and when Disney threw money at him to direct DuckTales, he accepted, but then fucked off the fox anyway and handed the show over to Terrace, who he was already dating at the time. And now, Terrace is also getting her own show, just like Nafsi did. Aside from these two, there are multiple other women he may or may not have slept with and may or may not have advanced the careers thereof afterwards. And what's interesting is that Nafsi said that Tom, the devil character in Star, is a composite of all her exes, so there's some Hirsch in there somewhere. Although, for the record, according to rumor, Nafsi still wants to fuck him. I don't see what relevance someone's sex life, or in this case, alleged sex life, has to a video that's supposed to be an expose. Who Alex Hirsch allegedly sleeps with is nobody's business but his own and the person that he is with. You weren't exposing injustice and you certainly weren't exposing despicable and predatory behavior. You were spreading salacious gossip for the sole purpose of artificially inflating interest in a bunch of unverified and unsubstantiated allegations against high-profile cartoon showrunners. In regards to the cheating, I'll say that if Alex really did cheat on some Sonic cosplayer in order to pursue a relationship with Dana Terrace, then that is horrible. Cheating is not something I condone, nor is it something I would wish upon anybody. But at the same time, if he really did cheat, then that should be between him and the woman he allegedly cheated on. It should not have been broadcasted to the public because it's none of the public's business. Second of all, Darren Nepsey did not get her job because Alex Hirsch allegedly stuck his ogre into her swamp. Just quickly, when we did the Cartoon Institute, Darren Nepsey came in and pitched Star and the Forces of Evil to us, and we in the room were like, this is fantastic, let's make it, and we were told like, yeah, we're not doing girl shows. Yeah. Like, but, but why? It's no, great, she's it, great, it it's here, it, why? and it was just, nope. I didn't do a very good job of explaining this in the original video, so I'm going to properly explain how Darren Nepsey actually got her job at Disney TBA. Nepsey pitched Star vs. the Forces of Evil, which at the time was known as Star and the Forces of Evil, to Cartoon Network's Cartoon Institute program in 2008, while she was still studying at Cal Arts. The show's original premise was centered around Star Butterfly as a young girl that believed she had magical powers. Craig McCracken just so happened to be one of the main figureheads behind the Cartoon Institute, and he loved Darren's pitch so much that he wanted to greenlight the show on the spot. 
but obviously he did not have that power, so he heavily pushed Cartoon Network to give the show a green light. But they refused because at the time, they had absolutely no interest in making a cartoon that was centered around a female protagonist. Basically, their response was, we're not doing girl shows and that's that. Too bad. Nepsy graduated from CalArts a year later, and would begin her career in the animation industry by working on shows like Mad and Robot and Monster. McCracken ended up leaving Cartoon Network shortly after Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends ended its run, and the Cartoon Institute was effectively dissolved. McCracken ended up landing at Disney TVA, where he began developing the show that would eventually become Wander Over Yonder, and when the opportunity arose to start hiring for this new show, he didn't hesitate to bring Nepsey on board. She worked on the show's first season as a storyboard revisionist, and in between her time doing that, she had the opportunity to pitch a revised version of Star vs. the Forces of Evil, which now centered around Star Butterfly as a teenage princess that actually had magical powers. Disney liked her pitch and gave the show a formal green light, and the rest, as they say, is history. So your allegation that Darren Nepsey only got her job at Disney TVA because Alex Hirsch allegedly inserted his token into her coin slot is categorically false. It doesn't end there, by the way, because much like Ward, Hirsch not only hires and promotes his fuck buddies, he also does the same with his friends. He hired his buddy Robert Ryan Quarry, who spends his workday sleeping under his desk. He only hired Terrace in the first place because he was asked to by another one of his friends. And then he hired Amelia Lorenz because he was asked to by Terrace. Beyond using the entire industry as his personal casting couch, rumor has it that he even goes so far as to start fights with other people working for or with him if he suspects they might be interested in someone he already plans on screwing. Expanding on this, and this has to be th the best part of the video, there is apparently a veritable plague of STDs going around this uh, big happy family. See, almost everyone working at Cartoon Network and Disney TVA allegedly has a venereal disease they got from someone else who's also working there. At one point during our interview, my source illustrated for me the trajectory of a single STI as it hopped across five different people working at three different shows at two different studios that may or may not have originated from a prostitute. And explain to me that at least one person involved in this chain was married to someone else who works there and habitually cheats on their spouse with other co-workers. For decency's sake, I'm leaving their names and the names of some of the other people I was told Hirsch may have slept with out of this video unless something happens in the future that makes this information somehow relevant. But I will say that there is some speculation that Sabrina Katugo is now exclusively dating women because she's mad at her last boyfriend for giving her an STD. How do I even respond to this? This entire dumpster fire of a video is about on the same level as those tacky celebrity gossip magazines that you see at the checkout lane at your local grocery store. The allegations that are presented in this video, and the ones against Hirsch in particular, are so outlandish and over the top that it's completely impossible to take any of it seriously. Alex Hirsch gave everyone STDs because he has mastered the art of sticking his hot dog in between a bun. He did not master the art of protecting himself with the Trojan Man and decided to go completely commando because he's number one and not number two. Alex Hirsch took a dump in a trash can because Taco Bell is too delicious and he didn't want to worship the porcelain throne. Alex Hirsch jacks off to porn late at night while he's at work because those anime titties are too irresistible. They are so irresistible that he tugs on his golden ticket until he explodes like a volcano. Alex Hirsch cheated on some Sonic cosplayer to date a four-eyed owl lady with tattoos who rolls down the street smoking that herbal essence while she sips on some gin and juice. Alex Hirsch starts fights with people who he suspects are interested in women he plans on filling up with his Twinkie Cream. Alex Hirsch has transformed into Bowser and has used his massive dragon hammer to plow through every single Princess Peach in the Mushroom Kingdom. All of those Princess Peaches became pregnant and gave birth to a bunch of evil dragon turtle babies known as the Koopalins. Alex Hirsch is the father of the Koopalins. I didn't make this up as a punchline for a joke. This is a 100% confirmed fact. 
The reason I'm able to say that this is a confirmed fact is because my trusted source that works at Nintendo told me that this totally happened. In fact, let's take a quick detour here. One bad trend that started even before Ward got into the industry was cartoons sneaking gay kisses into the last episode of the show because once it airs, it's too late for them to get in trouble with the network or get fired over this. They then pretend retroactively that they got the green light on this from the studio and that this was the corporation giving off a, uh, a sign of allyship to the agenda that they're pushing. In reality, of course, like I said, in Adventure Time, it was snuck in by one of the storyboard artists. The same is true with Legend of Korra, because Nickelodeon has a very small S&P department, and the creators even admitted that they slipped this under the radar. Disney's S&P division, by contrast, threatened to cancel an entire episode of Gravity Falls when Alex Hirsch tried to put a gay kiss in it, but he still managed to sneak it in, of course, as usual, into the last episode. Now, Napsy claimed that Disney gave her the go-ahead to put a gay kiss into Star vs. mid-season, but from the sound of the story she tells about it, it comes off like the person who was supposed to tell her not to do this didn't really feel like arguing that day. And like I said in my video, the moment Disney noticed a hint of backlash, they pulled the episode entirely, but eventually brought it back when people didn't raise enough of a stink about it to make this financially worthwhile. The point is, what you're seeing isn't an industry deciding to promote an ideology or support a cause. It's two studios, both of which employ the same small group of people who are all friends with each other or uh, lovers of each other, we'll get to that, and whose combined numbers aren't enough to fill up an entire room. Letting their guard down and having this tiny handful of people exploit the fact that they're not paying attention to smuggle their propaganda onto the airwaves. And I have a feeling that the moment these studios catch on or the second one of these cartoons causes enough of a controversy to give them some bad press, the executives up top are going to put a much tighter grip around these people's necks. So Cartoon Network Studios and Disney TVA were completely negligent and let their guard down because these high-profile cartoon showrunners snuck in gay kisses that they were completely aware of because they had to give the green light in order for it to be on the show, because that makes sense, right? By the way, did anyone notice that he didn't bother to explain why modern cartoons sneaking in gay kisses and normalizing same-sex relationships is a bad trend? I'll give him the benefit of the doubt in the sense that he probably has his reasons for having this opinion, but for whatever reason that I'll never understand, he didn't explain those reasons. Is it a bad trend because you personally feel that it's shoehorned and insincere and that these modern cartoons focus way too much on saying, we have a gay kiss in our cartoon, isn't that great? We have gay characters in our cartoon, isn't that spectacular? Look at how diverse and progressive we are. Or is it a bad trend because it doesn't align with your particular worldviews? Either one of these reasons would have been fine instead of saying that the mere existence of same-sex relationships in modern cartoons is a bad trend. This video is the YouTube equivalent of Randy Marsh in that one episode of South Park who had to use his own imagination to relieve himself of his massive supply of ectoplasm. It is all over the place, because as I mentioned earlier in the video, he gives explanations for certain allegations and doesn't do it for others. So what you end up getting is this very inconsistent microwave type of quality where it's hot on one end and cold on the other. What makes this even worse is the fact that he says that the mere existence of same-sex relationships is propaganda. Because as we all know, teaching kids that same-sex relationships exist and that they are just as healthy and normal as straight relationships is totally propaganda. If that is honestly what he considers to be propaganda, then the word propaganda has completely lost any and all meaning. Anyway, pretty much all the things I suspected about the shows I talked about in previous videos were pretty much absolutely right. So let's see how this comes into play in one of those shows. It's time we talked about Steven Universe. Again. Like I said, Rebecca Sugar got her job because Ward found her on Tumblr and hired her because she had a large following there. And since Sugar copied everything she learned working with Ward right down to using Tumblr as a help wanted ad, because of this, the writing and storyboarding of the show is just as messy and unsupervised as that of Adventure Time. 
leading to much of the same results. And while my source is no lawyer, they told me that from their interactions with the people involved, they believe that, just as I suspected, Steven Universe is actively written the way that it is because they're trying to avoid hiring men. They also confirmed that Ian Jones Quarty probably got his job because he was Sugar's boyfriend. Speaking of which, Quarty, who now also has his own show, possibly thanks to Sugar, may be trying to do the same thing with OKKO, OK but without much success since his show doesn't have a good excuse to hire women to voice male characters. When I first watched this video, that comment perplexed me, and it still perplexes me two years after the fact. Why is it written to avoid hiring men? How is it written to avoid hiring men? These are questions that should have been answered in this video, but for some reason it was left on the cutting room floor. I'm going to assume that the reason he made this comment is because the majority of the characters on the show are female, and on top of that, lesbian relationships in the form of fusions are a core part of the show's identity. If that isn't the reason he made this comment, then I honestly have no idea what he's talking about, because from what I've seen, nothing about Steven Universe has ever given me the indication that it's a man-hating show, or that it was written in a specific way because Rebecca Sugar wanted to avoid hiring men. If what you were saying was true, then Steven wouldn't be a boy, and he wouldn't be the main character. The show wouldn't be named after Rebecca's brother, who coincidentally is also named Steven. The show's characters would be entirely female, and the show would be known as Lesbian Space Rocks. The show's writing staff would be entirely female, and they would make this god-awful trailer talking about how diverse and progressive they are for having an all-female writing staff instead of talking about the show itself. The trailer would then showcase the gems snorting massive amounts of cocaine, chugging massive amounts of whiskey, and having massive orgies that would make the orgy scene at the end of Sausage Party look like Barney the Dinosaur. The trailer would finally end with Rebecca Sugar snapping Miss Frizzle's neck to become the God Emperor of Planet Earth. Now, in addition to confirming all the things I already know, my source did tell me a few other things that I think you'll find interesting. One aspect of the show that a lot of people were surprised I didn't touch on in my original video was the Steven Bombs. The bizarre airing schedule where episodes will be aired in batches in between hiatuses, sometimes lasting up to six months. At the time, if I had brought it up, I would have assumed that it was the result of the crew being lazy and Cartoon Network having an awful management that can't keep their employees in line. But it turns out that that's not really the case. The Steven Bombs exist to hide the show's abysmal ratings. See, it works like this. When the show was airing regularly, the ratings were bad and declining fast, and Cartoon Network knew that they'd be forced to cancel the show if it keeps up the way that it was. They also knew that firing the first female showrunner in their history and admitting that hiring women, uh, I, mean, I mean hiring Sugar, was a mistake. That wouldn't be very progressive of them and they didn't want to deal with the potential backlash. So instead, they came up with this. You see, every time a Steven Bomb drops, the ratings spike due to the anticipation and the short flash in the pan nature of dumping a handful of episodes in one shot. And those seemingly arbitrary time gaps in between bombs they're the result of the network looking for good time slots to air this shit when nothing else is on so they don't have to compete, because if Steven Universe aired against anything halfway watchable, everyone would just change the channel. So combine all these factors together, and if you only look at the raw numbers, it looks like this show is doing gangbusters and they can keep Sugar employed while pretending someone wants to watch this shit. As I mentioned in the original video, the Steven Bomb format was introduced in Season 2, a fan of the show made a chart all the way back in 2017 that showcased the ratings for every single Steven Universe episode that had been made up until that point, which included the first four seasons and the first few episodes of Season 5. The episodes that are highlighted in color were released in the Steven Baum format, and as you can clearly see, the show's ratings were far from abysmal. Steven Universe was consistently getting over a million viewers an episode for most of its run, even when there were episodes that weren't released in the Steven Bomb format. As a matter of fact, the show's ratings didn't start to decline until the fifth episode of season 5. The ratings in the majority of the episodes in that season and the entirety of Steven Universe's future had less than a million viewers. 
Cartoon Network did not create the Steven Bomb format as a way to disguise decline in ratings, that doesn't even make any logical sense from a business perspective, because if the show's ratings were truly abysmal and no one was watching it, the show would have been cancelled after its first season, and the fact that Rebecca Sugar is a woman wouldn't have changed that, because at the end of the day, Cartoon Network is a business that is out to make money, and guess what? Networks don't create event formats for shows that are failing and have terrible ratings. And don't think I didn't hear your comment about hiring women in animation. See, it works like this. When the show was airing regularly, the ratings were bad and declining fast. And Cartoon Network knew that they'd be forced to cancel the show if it keeps up the way that it was. They also knew that firing the first female showrunner in their history and admitting that hiring women, uh, I, mean, I mean hiring sugar, was a mistake. Sexist is not a word I use very often, but in this instance I can confidently say that this is actually 100% grade A sexism. He clearly says that Cartoon Network would realize that hiring women, I mean hiring sugar, was a mistake because of Steven Universe's declining ratings and that the Steven Bomb format was created to avoid firing Sugar so they could continue to seem progressive. He tries to play it off by saying that hiring Sugar was a mistake even though he said the exact opposite just a second earlier. You can dislike Rebecca Sugar and Steven Universe all you want, but just because you don't like her in the show that she created doesn't mean you should use her as a way of saying hiring women for animation is a mistake. One person is not representative of an entire gender. I can't even believe I have to say this, because in my opinion it should be common sense, but as we all know, common sense is in very short supply these days. Does he even bother to explain why he has this opinion? Of course he doesn't. He just blurts it out and then tries to pretend that he meant something completely different in the hopes that his audience is too stupid to notice it. Is Rebecca Sugar the evil, mustache twirling supervillain in the Saturday morning cartoon that goes on in his mind? Because the way he talks about her in this video, and the way he presents the allegations against her, goes so far beyond the typical dislike of a show that it comes off as oddly personal. But hey, that's just a theory. A YouTube theory. And that's just in relation to women in animation. Let me lay out your future in general if you decide to go work for Cartoon Network or Disney TVA. First, you'll be plucked from your career of posting ugly scribbles on Tumblr to a job as a revisionist at one of these studios where you'll spend your days getting paid pennies working in an unprofessional work environment. Most of your day will be wasted on petty bickering over what the plot should be while the person who should be making these calls sleeps in his office. Prepare to have to tolerate people constantly making personal attacks against you over your skin color or not being gay enough until you're eventually blacklisted for telling Darren Napsey to go fuck herself. At that point, if you want to keep your job, you'll have to pick between two options, either pretending to be trans or sucking Alex Hirsch's cock. If you pick option number two, you'll get to wear your herpes as a badge of honors as you are rewarded with your own show and can finally, after working there for less than one year, get your own office where you can sleep while your storyboarders bicker like children about the best way to put a gay sex scene into your children's show without the censors catching on. Then. After a long day of tart wrangling a bunch of idiots and fighting off accusations of being a white supremacist for not letting them ruin your show by having the main character join the communist party, as you go back to your shitty alley apartment that you can hardly afford because your shitty union can't negotiate for better pay, remember, don't call this a grave. It's the future you chose. The biggest problem I have with this closing statement is that you are telling people who want to pursue a career in the animation industry what they can expect based on salacious gossip that is not backed up by anything that makes any sort of logical sense or has any kind of proof behind it. This is blatant fear-mongering and sensationalism disguised as a warning to aspiring animators about what the animation industry is really like, which would make sense if there was actual evidence to back up all of these outrageous claims. 
students, but since the allegations in this video sound like they were made up by a high school cheerleader that's jealous that the nerdy and unpopular girl is dating her ex-boyfriend, this entire closing statement comes off as emotionally manipulative and it holds absolutely no weight whatsoever. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the animation industry is perfect because it's not, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it doesn't have problems because it has a lot of problems. What I will say is that you shouldn't blindly believe everything that you hear in a YouTube video just because it sounds good. Because if there's one thing I've learned over the years is that if something sounds way too good to be true, it probably is. Which in my opinion sums up Easy Peasy's video perfectly. If this video was done right and there was actual bite to back up all of the bark, this video could have been an all-time classic. What we got instead was an inconsistent and factually incorrect mess that loves inhaling the smell of its own farts. And what makes it even worse is the fact that this video wasn't a joke. It was something that Easy Peasy believed in without question because it suited his particular bias against modern cartoons that are made in the West. He essentially tried to build a house without any foundation to support it. And when you try to build a house without a foundation, the house just ends up collapsing. Hello everyone, I am the Chio of YouTube, Susan the family friendly corporate pandering robot. Thank you so much for watching, cartoon creators are the worst 2020. This video was brought to you by YouTube, the internet's no one babysitter, either make videos for the kids or go fork yourself.